Okay, welcome to another week of 1211 Lab here at North Georgia. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the determination of specific heat, uh, in particular for some various metals that we'll be looking at in the lab. And just to come some kind of quick background information terminology so people kind of know what, what we're really looking at here, because uh, I know all the lectures are in kind of different places right now. Uh, when we talk about the idea of heat just by itself, heat is typically going to be represented by the lowercase q uh, in terms of any kind of equations or things like that that we see it in. And what it is, it's the flow of energy between two different objects at different temperatures. So if you have two different objects or even just substances or materials uh, that you put in contact with one another, if there are different temperatures, they're going to try to kind of equilibrate or balance out their temperatures to be the same. And the way they do that is you're always going to see energy flow from the hot object to the cold object. And when we talk about heat, since it is kind of really a, an amount of energy that's being transferred, energy is units of joules, so heat when we measure it is also going to have units of joules uh, when we talk about it. Now, calculating heat, or really the energy involved with heat transfer, uh, the main equation we're typically going to see is this one right here where we have Q equals MC delta T. Uh, and specifically, it's a C sub S here, and so I'm going to talk about kind of the, the units of all this right here. This is probably the most common version of the equation. It involves mass for our, our M, and this mass will usually be in grams. C sub S are what we call a specific heat capacity. Sometimes you might not see the subscript. It might just be MC delta T. That's fine. Um, but really pay attention to the units on this constant. So whenever you see this capital C, look at the units. If it's joules per gram degree Celsius, that's how you know that the mass, basically you need mass in the equation. Right, because there are these other versions of the equation that I'll, I'll mention here in a moment. Then the last part here, this delta T, the temperature change. Uh, something that's really, really important about delta T, it has to be the final temperature that you're looking at minus the initial temperature something was at before your process started. Uh, it has to be that order. Um, otherwise, the sign conventions that we'll talk about in just a second for heat aren't really going to make sense. Now, the other versions of this equation, we have Q equals N C sub M delta T or just Q equals plain C delta T. Uh, these other versions are really just for kind of different situations depending on our units. If we're given a heat capacity, it's what we call a molar heat capacity. It's what that C sub M really stands for. The units of this constant right here would be joules per mole times degree Celsius, uh, or maybe joules per mole Kelvin. Uh, we'll talk about the temperature side of things here in a second. But regardless, this, this C here, the C sub M, if we have moles in its units, we're going to want to use moles in the equation. And so that's what the lowercase n is here. So anytime this semester we see a lowercase n like this, it's pretty much always going to reference the number of moles that we're looking at. Uh, for the version of this equation where it's Q equals just plain C delta T, the plain C we call it just a, a heat capacity. And normally its units are going to be joules per degree Celsius or joules per degree Kelvin. Uh, where there's no mass, there's no moles in the units of the constant, and that's why there's no mass or moles in the equation either. Uh, and we'll see some examples of kind of when we use the different versions of this equation as we talked about this week's lab. Like I said, this will be the main version here with the mass in included uh, that we'll use most often. But we will see for our something called calorimeter constant here this week, we'll actually use this version to look at how much energy is absorbed by kind of like a, a whole system, right? Because this, this version of the equation is really only useful when we have something that you can't really measure like the mass or the moles uh, very effectively. Now, one last thing about heat before we get into any more specific details, especially kind of pertaining to this week's lab. Uh, heat does have a sign convention, meaning whether heat is positive or negative is actually important. And so that's why I mentioned that for the delta T in that equation, how delta T is final minus initial, that's important because if you change that order, you're going to affect the sign of heat itself. And the sign tells you where the energy is going. Right? If you have a positive Q, that means heat is moving into your system or whatever thing that you're actually looking at. Uh, in terms of like an energy change. Uh, if you have a negative Q, that means whatever it is that you're looking at that's changing temperature has lost heat and that heat is basically being released into the surroundings from your container or whatever it is that's changing temperature. Now, again, some more specific things here, kind of uh, some terminology. That term specific heat capacity that I mentioned on the previous slide, what it really is, it's the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Uh, and so this particular value is constant for any particular substance or material as long as it doesn't change physical state. So for instance, like water, regardless of what temperature is at, liquid water has the same specific heat capacity all the time. But if you do change its physical state to ice or to steam, the specific heat capacity will be different. And if you change water into something else entirely, like a different compound, then you're going to get a new specific heat there as well. <laughs> now for some general kind of comparisons and just kind of like numbers and some things to be thinking about, uh, water is considered to have a, a relatively high specific heat capacity. 
even though when we see its value here in a little bit, it's only 4.1, uh, like 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, but that's considered to be a relatively high value. And in terms of what it means to have a high specific heat, it means you have to add or take away a lot of energy before you actually notice a big temperature change. Uh, and so big specific heat capacities or large specific heat capacities mean you have to have a lot of energy involved before you actually notice a real temperature change. Uh, whereas things like metals, for instance, that we're, we're, um, sorry, that we're really going to be looking at this week uh, in terms of trying to calculate their specific heat capacities, uh, metals have fairly low specific heats because they change temperature pretty easily. Right? If you think about trying to like stir a pot of boiling water if you're doing any cooking, you typically don't want to use a metal spoon to do it because that metal spoon is going to get really hot really fast um, because it has a fairly low specific heat. It doesn't take much energy for it to warm up a lot. Whereas if you used a, say, a wooden spoon, you can use the wooden spoon for a long period of time because it takes a lot of energy for that wood to really warm up. It has a very high specific heat capacity uh, in comparison to the metal. All right, so just a, a quick sample calculation here. Uh, if we want to know how much heat is transferred when 25 grams of water cools from 38 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius, uh, we should be able to calculate that really as long as we have this constant here for water. So this is our specific heat capacity for water. And again, remember what I said before, look at the units here. It says joules per gram degree Celsius. Since the grams are here, that means we want to use the equation for Q that's going to have grams in it, so the one that has mass. So this is going to be our equation we can use to calculate the heat transfer. And as we plug everything in, we have our mass, we have our specific heat capacity constant, and we do want to be careful about the temperatures. right? From the description, the water cools from 38 to 25. And remember I said delta T, we always want to do it in the order of final temperature minus initial. So we have 25 degrees is the final minus the initial 38. That is going to be a negative value, which means that the Q here is going to be negative. Uh, and that should pretty much always happen. If you have a temperature that's decreasing, you should have a negative Q because that thing you're looking at that's decreasing in temperature, it's losing heat in order to basically have its temperature go down. Uh, and so negative sign, that's just telling us which direction the heat flow is really occurring in. Now, the other thing we're going to take a look at here, besides just kind of the using these equations for Q, uh, we're going to talk about something called calorimetry. Uh, and this idea of calorimetry is really just looking and kind of studying uh, the energy flow via heat and really just kind of trying to track, like, where is the heat going? Like, what's gaining heat and what's losing heat and how those things are actually related to each other? Because in order for something to gain heat, something else must have lost it and vice versa. So there's never going to be just something, oh, this gained all this heat, but there's no source of where that energy came from that uh, heated that particular object or substance up. Uh, and so one of the things we'll typically see with calorimetry, uh, and we'll be effectively kind of using something similar to this uh, in this week's lab calculations, is the idea that the heat gained by something has to equal negative the heat lost by something else. Uh, and so what, what this equation is really telling us is that these two things should be equal to each other. If something's gaining heat, that means something must have lost that same exact amount of heat. Uh, and the difference in them is really just the sign. The numbers numerically should be the same for each of these. Uh, and one of the ways we can measure heat being gained or lost is really just through temperature. By measuring temperature both before and after, like a reaction or before some process happens, we can estimate the heat absorbed or released during that particular process. Uh, and then we're able to track, uh, and really what we'll look at kind of like in this week's experiment, if we're going to have metal, we're going to have a metal that we're going to heat up, we're going to put it in much colder water, and then we, we can do is measure the temperature change of both the metal and the water and figure out like how much heat's being really absorbed or lost uh, by the water and the metal respectively. Now, when we talk about calorimetry in lecture, you'll probably hear about two different types. Uh, one's going to be a constant pressure situation. One's going to be a constant volume situation. Everything we do in lab is always going to be a constant pressure situation, unless for some reason we have kind of a very tightly enclosed container that everything's happening in where the pressure stays constant. Uh, tip, I'm sorry, where the, where the volume would stay constant. Uh, for us, just doing a lab like in an open cup, uh, the pressure is going to be constant because atmospheric pressure is pretty much constant. So that's what we'll be taking a look at. And so typically, and I, I put some different kind of equations here. This will probably apply more to lecture. We're not really going to talk too much about delta H and enthalpy in lab this week, uh, although in a couple weeks we'll be doing another experiment with enthalpy of neutralization. And we will actually come back and talk a little bit more about delta H and this idea of Q and delta H being equal at constant pressure. Uh, but this is the type of calorimetry that we're going to be focusing on today, this constant pressure situation. Uh, you'll sometimes hear it called coffee cup calorimetry because it's kind of what we're doing is just using like a styrofoam coffee cup uh, to do kind of our experiments in. For constant, for constant volume, real quick, sorry, before I jump ahead, uh, for constant volume situations, if you ever hear the term bomb calorimeter, that's going to be a constant volume situation. Uh, it's probably the only real constant volume situation you're likely to encounter for, for general chemistry anyway, too. 
Uh, and that's something you're really only going to see in the lecture. All right. Now, I think the easiest way to really try and introduce this idea of kind of how calorimetry is really working uh, is just to kind of walk you through a sample calculation that's really similar to what we'll be doing in the lab this week. So in this particular example, we have a 50 gram piece of metal uh, that's initially at 225 degrees Celsius. We're dropping it into 125 milliliters of water that's at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, and we're told the final temperature of everything mixed together is 38 degrees. That's where it kind of all kind of equilibrates or uh, kind of balances out to. And we want to calculate a few different things. Uh, remember, our goal for the whole experiment is going to be to calculate specific heat capacity, but we can't do that really right away. We have to calculate a couple other things first. Uh, so kind of the steps we can go through, we can figure out what's the heat that's being gained by the water. And then we can also figure out what's the heat that's being lost by the metal. And we'll see that this particular part in lecture, you may just kind of actually end up seeing that these two things are kind of just equal but opposite, like kind of that Q lost equals negative Q gained um, from like the previous slide. Uh, but we're going to be a little bit more particular since we're doing this in lab in a real lab setting. The reality is in lab that this is not, these two are not going to be perfectly equal. And so we will have something called a calorimeter constant that we'll use to help us go from kind of one to the other. And then once we've actually figured out both the heat gained by the water and eventually then our, our heat that's lost by the metal, particularly this second part, once we know the uh, heat that the metal has lost, then we should be able to calculate the specific heat capacity of the metal at that point in time. Uh, now, we will need a couple other pieces of information to be able to do this calculation. Uh, and these are both going to be things that we're going to be using for this week in lab. Uh, the specific heat capacity for water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, and then we're also going to have this just plain heat capacity for our, well, really our coffee cup, or it's kind of styrofoam cup calorimeter, uh, that's going to be 17 joules uh, per degree Celsius for its heat capacity. Uh, and that, we're going to refer to that as our calorimeter constant. Uh, and we're going to use this to basically figure out how much heat our system, like our, in our case, like our coffee cup itself, uh, and the general surroundings are going to be absorbing during the experiment. And I'll, I'll detail exactly how that works uh, in just a moment. But as a starting point, we're going to look at what's the heat being gained by the water in this process that was described. Because uh, we have a temperature change. Anytime you have a temperature change of something, you should be able to calculate the heat involved. Uh, so we can use Q equals MC delta T for the water. Because it's constant on the previous slide, and from, from a unit standpoint, remember we were given 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius for that heat capacity for water. And so we're going to want then the mass of water in grams so the units cancel. And notice I have 125 grams here. On the last slide, though, what we were told is that it was 125 milliliters of water. Well, conveniently for us, from a calculational standpoint, water's density is pretty much exactly one gram per milliliter. So if we have 125 milliliters of water, that's 125 grams of water uh, for the experiment. And then from our temperature standpoint, water started at 25 degrees uh, and it ended at 38. That was the final temperature of kind of everything. Uh, and remember, final minus initial is how we're always going to calculate that delta T. So 38 minus 25, we get 13 here for the delta T. Everything's positive, uh, positive energy change, so the Q will be positive. So we get our heat gained by the water is about 6,790 joules uh, is what we found. Now, if we want to calculate the heat that's lost by the metal, this is going to be a little bit more complicated. Right? We have to figure out, well, where all did the heat go from the metal? Well, in a perfect world, all of it would be gained by the water. But the reality is, kind of like I mentioned before, that's not necessarily what will happen. Uh, but we do still have this Q lost equals negative Q gained. or And again, that negative sign can go on either side. It doesn't really matter uh, for this kind of part of the equation. But if we think about this, water gained heat, the metal lost heat, what else happened? Well, if the coffee cup that we started with also has to warm up, for our uh, process to take place and for everything to kind of balance at a final temperature, like the coffee cup's also going to balance at that kind of final temperature, then that means that our Q gained here is really going to be the heat of the water, but also plus the heat of really our surroundings or the coffee cup itself. Uh, and so that's where our calorimeter constant really comes into play. Uh, this is something that we will actually look at how we can calculate something like this in a few weeks when we do that enthalpy of neutralization lab that I mentioned before. But for this week, we're going to be given that constant. We're told we have a calorimeter constant that's 17 joules per degree Celsius. That means if we know the delta T of our water, that same delta T is going to apply to our surroundings and container. And if our heat capacity here, our C is 17 joules per degree Celsius, and we know the change in temperature, we can take just delta T times 17 joules per degree Celsius, and we'll find the energy that's necessary uh, to heat up the coffee cup and its surroundings to that final temperature. And so if, if we calculate Q for, and I've labeled it here as Q of our calorimeter, Q of our calorimeter in this case is about 221 joules. 
Uh, and so it took 221 joules to heat up the calorimeter in our general surroundings, uh, about 6,790 joules to heat up the water itself from their initial 25 degrees to our final, final temperature of 38. <clears throat> and now once we finally have all this information, we can kind of put together a, a perspective of how much heat's lost by the metal because the heat lost by the metal needs to equal all of the heat that was gained by both the water and the calorimeter, right? So adding these two things together. Uh, the only difference being that, again, the heat from the metal is gonna be negative because the metal lost that heat, it was giving off that heat. So putting these things together, we have our heat for our water, our heat for our calorimeter. It's a total of about 7,010 roughly joules. Um, and notice I, I, it's 7,010 because I'm just trying to, and I'm trying to pay a little bit of attention to significant digits here. Right, adding two things, if you only know this one really technically to the, the tens place, we're going to round to the tens place as we add them. And so if this is our, our Q for our metal, I'm sorry, this is our Q gained basically by everything, Q for the metal is going to be negative 7,010 joules. And once we have the Q for our metal, now we can actually find its specific heat capacity, right? Because we can still use the Q equals MC delta T equation because the original problem had a mass for our metal and it had our final initial temperatures. And now if we have a Q, we can actually find the C sub S, right? So kind of plugging all of our pieces in, if we rearrange this for our specific heat capacity, that should be Q, the negative 7,010 joules, divided by our mass, which was almost, uh, or was exactly 50 grams for the metal, uh, times delta T. And again, delta T order matters, right? So uh, here we have 38 degrees Celsius minus 225 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so we ended at 38, so that's our, our final, minus the 225 initial. So it is going to be a very big negative temperature change. But with a negative delta T and a negative Q, we are going to get a positive specific heat capacity. And that is important. Heat capacity, like any of our C constants, whether it's like C sub S or C sub M or just plain C, all of those different heat capacities always have to be positive. Because remember, it's the energy it takes to raise the temperature of something by one degree. You can never take heat away and have the temperature go up. So we're always gonna get those positive specific heats. Uh, and when we finish this calculation, we get a specific heat capacity that's about 0 0.726 joules per gram degree Celsius. It's a good bit smaller in the specific heat capacity for water, um, which basically just tells us that it's easier for that metal to change temperature than it would be for the water. Um, and so that would be kind of our, our final answer that we're kind of working our way towards here at the end of this. So that's kind of a, a quick run through really of all the calculations you'll typically be doing for the lab. Um, measurement wise, the things you're going to be recording, like you're going to be measuring the masses of the metal, you're going to be measuring the volumes also of the water you use, so you have a mass for your water portion of its calculation, uh, and you're going to be measuring temperature changes. Like those are going to be all the kind of different things you're really measuring in the lab, and then you're calculating these specific heat capacities uh, for the various metals that you're going to be looking at. Uh, and so kind of more details then on, on the experiment itself, uh, we are going to be heating up metal samples. Uh, we're not going to be heating them to 200 degrees like in that, sample, in that example we just did. Uh, instead, we're going to be heating them in a boiling water bath. Uh, so you're basically going to set up a hot water bath, and we're probably going to use a hot plate to do this rather than Bunsen burners. Uh, the hot plate's just going to be a little easier to use uh, and continuously use throughout the experiment. And so what you can do is you can actually take a water bath. Uh, you're going to heat it up on your hot plate, get that water to the point where it's boiling, and you can use a, one of our thermometers in LabQuest or other thermocouples for our LabQuest as a thermometer to measure the temperature of the boiling water. And what you're going to do then is take test tubes that are filled with just the dry metal samples that you're going to be doing using for your experiment. And you're going to put all of those test tubes down just into the water. Uh, and by setting the test tubes in the water, hopefully the metals that are in those test tubes are going to heat up very close to the boiling water temperature. Uh, and then by measuring the boiling water bath temperature, you know the approximate starting initial temperature for all of those metals uh, when you go to do your experiment. So that's how we can get our initial temperatures for the metals uh, that are going to be heated up. And then you're going to add that hot metal to just roughly room temperature water. Uh, and you'll have the initial temperature of the water before you add the metal, the initial temperature of the metal before you put it in the water, mix them together. And you're basically just going to wait for that temperature to kind of stabilize. Uh, and probably what you'll see as you do this, you'll see that temperature, if you record it over time, it's going to hit kind of a, a plateau uh, where it heats up and eventually it'll actually start kind of cooling back down. That temperature, max temperature you get to while it's heating up, that's going to be kind of your final temperature uh, of your entire solution. And once you have that, that kind of final temperature, uh, and do be careful, I guess, experimentally here, uh, when you're kind of putting everything together, try to avoid splashing out some of the water. Uh, also try to avoid just if you're trying to like, throw the metal into the beaker, like you risk breaking the beaker because we are using metals, obviously. Uh, and so, but just to be careful with that. But once you have your final temperature, now you should be able to go back and actually do kind of the same series of calculations that we just went through, 
to find the specific heat capacity for the different metals you're going to be looking at in the lab. <clears throat> and so that's kind of our, our goal, really, of what we're doing. So the experimental setup, uh, it's not too bad. Uh, once you do have your water bath set up, you can basically have all of your test tubes with all of your metal samples just in the hot water bath, and you can actually just rotate. You can basically do, your, do the experiment for the first metal. When you're done with it, put it back in its test tube, put it back in the hot water bath, take out the next metal, and do the next experiment. And you can just kind of keep cycling it, and that way all of your other metal samples stay hot, and you don't have to have a bunch of downtime of like waiting for things to kind of heat up. Um, it'll just be kind of a, a more convenient way in, and it'll keep things moving faster. Um, because this is a lab, if you're not careful, it can, can take a reasonable, reasonably long amount of time, but it doesn't have to. Uh, if you're pretty efficient in how you set things up and kind of just continuously go through things, uh, you can actually complete the lab in a, in a fairly short amount of time uh, if you're organized with it. And then the last bit for this lab in terms of safety and waste, uh, we're not really using any real solutions or reactive chemicals this week, so there's nothing there we have to worry about safety-wise. Uh, but we are obviously using hot water, hot metals. If we have boiling water, that's always something you have to take a little bit of caution with. Uh, so just careful not to burn yourself. Obviously try to be careful not to tip over your beaker with boiling water and everything in it. Uh, obviously that could be a hazard as well, but really that's the only main safety concern of the week. Uh, from a disposal standpoint, like waste standpoint, uh, since we're, again, we're not really using any solutions or reactive chemicals, we're not doing any true chemical reactions, we're pretty much just going to have the metals in the water even when things are done. So the water can just be poured out down the sink, no special waste disposal there. Uh, and the metals, you just want to make sure once you're done with them and they're cooled at room temperature, make sure you dry them off good, uh, put them back where you got them originally in the hoods uh, or wherever else you kind of set them up uh, before the lab started. And so uh, pretty straightforward, I think, there from, from the safety and waste side, just Careful not to burn yourself with things. Waste-wise, nothing particular. Just water down the sink. Make sure the metals go back where they started. Uh, and then the experiment itself should be fairly straightforward. Uh, so hopefully everyone has a good week in lab this week. And we'll see you all next time.